Good evening. Welcome to the Majors and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel. My name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn Booksellers, which is an independent bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If this is your first virtual event viewing with us, welcome. If it's not, if you've been at multiple of our virtual author readings, welcome back and thank you so much for continuing to support our events program even as they have become virtual in the past year. Um, it's been quite a uh, Quite an adventure speaking with authors from their homes, uh, whether they be here in the Midwest, like our two speakers today, or from all over the world. Um, so today we're very pleased to have a conversation between two uh, Midwest writers, Anthony Bukowski and Jason Iwin. And uh, they are going to both be reading a little bit from their recent works, and then they will be having a conversation. Um, and we will be taking questions from you. If you have questions at any point during the broadcast, please type them down in the comments or the chat section on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching from. And at any point um, during the broadcast, take those at the end of the show. That is also where I'm going to be putting links to the books. Um, so if you are interested in heading to the Majors in Quinn website and checking out uh, these books by Tony and Jason, um, please do so. We you know, appreciate you showing up for this wonderful free event. But if you feel like buying a book, that is great because it helps us put on even more virtual events. Thank you for supporting an indie bookstore if that is what you choose to do today. So I'm just going to introduce the speakers and then they're going to kick off some readings. So Anthony Bukowski is an award-winning writer and a fellow of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters, member of the Polish American Historical Association. He's the author of the collections Time Between Trains, Children of Strangers, and Polonaise, and this uh, new collection that he'll be reading from tonight, The Blondes of Wisconsin. And Anthony, thank you for being here tonight. And Jason Owen is a poet, fiction writer, and professor who lives in the Twin Ports region of Northern Minnesota and Wisconsin. His poetry collection, Rose and Blood, won the $5,000 Miller Williams Poetry Prize. Thank you so much, Jason, for agreeing to join in on this event. All right, well, first we're gonna hear from Tony's uh, book. So Tony, I am gonna set you up on screen here and then Jason will be back and we'll uh, have a conversation after that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I've never, this is the third time in my life that I've uh, done such a thing on a computer. I had an interview with Chicago Loyola a couple of weeks ago, and last fall I had an interview with uh, some Russian translators. And uh, the last, the, the Russian translators interview and this one are uh, beamed from my friend Tom Johnson's house in the east end of Superior, Wisconsin, because I neither have the capacity to uh, have such a conference at home, I don't have a camera, nor would I get very good reception because my wife and I live in the country. So I'm glad you're here and please forgive me any missteps. Uh, Jason Iowin, my, uh, what would you call him? My uh, interlocutor tonight replaced me at University of Wisconsin Superior when I retired 11 years ago. Uh, my dear friend Barton Sutter, the Minnesota writer, he also retired at that time and was replaced by Julie Gard, an uh, awfully good poet. And another good person who came in was Jamie Barnum White. Uh, Bard and I and Deborah Schlocks, my former superior at UW uh, Superior, we hoped for the best. We had tried to work hard and, and succeed in teaching and writing when we were engaged at UW Superior. And we hoped that uh, those who followed us would continue that. Well, uh, these three have really uh, exceeded our expectations. I can tell you that. Uh, Jason, as Ann said, won the $5,000 Miller Williams Prize from, and publication with, from the University of Arkansas Press, a good press. And he has uh, many other distinctions uh, that I won't get into now. But uh, let me begin. Uh, I have written this book called The Blondes of Wisconsin, and I am grateful to the University of Wisconsin Press for publishing it. The book concerns, as do all of my books, a Polish American, Polish American figures. I've been writing about Polish Americans through virtually my entire writing, writing life. Uh, the principal character in this book is one Ed Bronkowski, nicknamed the Bronco. He's a professional 
former professional boxer who had a five and 20 ring record. Now he's in the early stages of boxer's dementia and is working as a deckhand on the Great Lakes freighter, Henry L. Stimson, which brings grain from Duluth Superior to Buffalo and then back. Uh, he, 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 Ed, deckhanded on H.L. Stimson, falls in love with the second cook, Verna Larson. Verna Larson escaped her husband, I think, uh, three or four years earlier. She just walked down to the waterfront, signed papers, and got on the Stimson as a second cook uh, because her life at home was intolerable. And while uh, on the lakes, while sailing, the two meet, Verna Larson and Ed Bronkowski. Let me read uh, a page, two pages from uh, the Blondes of Wisconsin. It's from the story Prospects. In this story, uh, we meet Ed Bronkowski early in his professional boxing career. His first fight, his first pro fight is gonna be at the Prom Center in St. Paul, which used to be on University Avenue, as I recall. I've seen a fight there. And his opponent is a, a fellow named Valentine Hammer. And the Bronco is really excited to get into the ring as a pro because he's already had an amateur career. And in the story Prospects, I write, the night of the Val Hammer bout, Mrs. Bronkowski knew it was her Eddie coming in by the way he rattled the storm door. She kept it hooked when her husband and Alphonse, her older boy, were working and when Ed was out. The heavy inside door to the back porch she locked when no one else would be coming home. Opening both doors, she looked for Ed among the stars. Next door, the slinker's house was dark except for one light on upstairs. Eddie, should I warm up some beef noodle soup? Nah, ma, he said from the corner of the house facing the garage. He was kicking ice from the downspout. Don't bother Mr. Slinker with that banging, Ed. He's probably writing his short stories. And don't slip on the stairs. You're right, he said, handing her the remains of a cinnamon bun. I don't feel like soup. How was the fight? Terrific, he said, tossing his coat on the kitchen chair. When I got hit in the head, I began thinking I was in the wrong place. In 40 amateur fights, I was never belted so hard. Sorry, the frosting's missing off the cinnamon bun, Ma. Butch ate it with his fingers, Butch is his manager. Use the knife, I told him. He'd asked the waitress for a bag of ice. When Butch thought I couldn't see him because of the swelling of my eye, I was holding the, I was holding the ice to it. His fat fingers started after the frosting on the bun. Don't worry, I've got news, Mrs. Brunkowski said. Your girl called. When are your dad and me going to meet her? You better contact her tomorrow morning. When your dad's home from the night shift and trying to sleep, he likes the phone kept off. You don't want no one talking or calling. You should respect your father, Ed. I do. I'm sore. That's all. I'm in a low place in life after the fight. I never told my girlfriend what I do for work. There's no shame in it, Eddie. I mean, being in the low place, We've been there, your father and I. Not like this, he said to his mother on the way upstairs. When he got in bed, he thought of the prom center in St. Paul, scene of the fight card. Let's have a good, clean, professional bite, bite about, the referee was saying. Then Valentine Hammer was driving his fists into him, Eddie Bronkowski. As pretty boy Hammer's corner shouted, Work the body and his head will fall. The Bronco blocked punches. He slipped others. Yet, after three three-minute rounds, the old guy's punch count topped 90 to the Bronco's 10 or 12. Keep your jab straight, Butch kept yelling. What jab? The Bronco had wondered during the three rounds he'd stayed, stayed upright, trying to clinch with his opponent. When the first preliminary ended, people were just coming in, buying beers, looking for their seats. Talking to the fans, the promoter hurried about. It was 7.15. The main event started in three hours. Not long after, Butch would be ordering pastries at Toby's Cafe in Hinkley. The Bronco remembered the referee signaling technical knockout. 
remembered Butch wiping him down with a towel, Butch with the spit bucket, Butch on the ring apron, helping him negotiate the stairs. Later, with his manager on the three-hour drive home up Interstate 35 to Superior, the Bronco marveled at the air as the older man's stomach gas would play. Now the Bronco recognized the ceiling tiles in his bedroom. I know where I am, he said. He heard his old man moving in the kitchen downstairs. Hail to the champ, Mr. Bronkowski said when Ed came downstairs. I'm going to five o'clock mass this afternoon. I've got to use the phone after breakfast, Dad. Your face looks like the poo-poo platter at Joe's Pagoda, Mr. Bronkowski said to him. Maybe so, Ed said. Take our collection envelope, Eddie. I can't attend mass when my asthma gets bad, his mother said. The envelope went in the basket two ushers passed around during the offertory. On it was the Bronkowski's name and today's date. You going to church, Pa? He just got home, Ed. Tonight your father has to work again. The old man poured coffee from his cup and drank it from the saucer in the old country way. Who rises early to him God gives, he said before he shook his head, rose from the table and went to bed. Two things I want, he added on the way out, that my boy go to mass and that he pay his Polish club dues. Ed's career doesn't advance much beyond that, though he has 19 additional pro fights in, uh, gee whiz, I can't remember where, uh, Buffalo, Detroit, um, and, and other places around the Great Lakes. Uh, but he's already on the way down, and his manager, Butch, somewhat takes advantage of him. Let me read one more page. This, this is from the story called The Second Cook on the Henry L. Stimson, and it concerns Ed and Verna Larson when they first meet. Verna is a Christian lady who studies the, the Bible while she's aboard. She's not been ashore in, I don't remember, 2,555 days because she left her husband, as I said, and, and to go back on shore would signal uh, defeat. And so she stays afloat all summer and fall long, all during the shipping season. And in winter, when the, the, the lakes freeze up and the locks freeze up and ships uh, take anchor in the harbors to overwinter, she works as a shipkeeper on the Henry L. Stimson. So she just doesn't go ashore. Uh, she reads from the Bible on the Stimson when they're en route somewhere. And then Ed comes back finally and introduces himself. And they talk. After the first and second times together, this will be a page, I think, one thing led to another between Ed and Verna. In the close quarters of a lake boat, you wouldn't think so much time would pass before you became acquainted with someone. We'd take turns reading. Then I'd talk about what we'd read, and he'd try to understand. Proverbs 22:11, I'd say, the Lord loves the pure of heart. The man of winning speech has the king for his friend. After a while, neither of us, Ed nor I, knew how to proceed with what we were doing. The long evenings passed. Sometimes I didn't see Ed. Having no practice with an emotional attraction like ours was becoming, caused, you might say, by scripture studies, I knew he was uncomfortable. I did too feel uncomfortable. By walking to the bow, maybe Ed was clearing his mind of me. Then in the cruise mess, I'd catch his eye. When he left the Stimson for a week, he sent me a card. He bought me a doll. During the time we were seeking each other, our hearts at play, I breaded his pork chops. On a pad of paper, he doodled my name. He was always the sweetest man. When we looked for signs of God's presence in our love, we knew that everything had grown from that one beginning seed when he'd first walked aft to see me. My face shiny from the heat in the galley, I must have looked terrible sometimes. Nothing about him displeased me, except he looked bewildered as though he were trying to find a way back from where he'd been traveling. I knew he regretted what he'd done in life. The swollen ridges over his eyes proved this. 
old scars on a journeyman's face. The pain I saw there, I could also hear in his voice. When a guy gets hurt or doesn't want to fight, I fill in for him, he said, as though he were still boxing. Now he was a journeyman on the H.L. Stimson plying the Great Lakes from Duluth to Buffalo. One night he said right out, I think of you, Verna. Why? I don't know. I've been away in my head. Shh, I said. When he touched my face, he said, I didn't know how to say this to you. Now you have, I said, knowing the heart is free once it admits its truth. That is an introduction to the theme of boxing, the theme of, uh, well, the Polish seaman, uh, Polish community he comes from, and, uh, and in an introduction to Bernal Larson. And now, Jason, uh, will you read some of the poems that I suggested to you? Tell us about the book a bit. Sure, yeah. Um, all right, so this is from Rose and Blood, which uh, you know, they're persona poems, uh, which means that the first half of the book is, is spoken by Rose Martha, who's a young woman, um, probably around 16, 17, who lives in a trailer park in the Duluth area. Um, and William Blood is, uh, um, speaks the other half of the poems, and he lives in Superior. He is kind of strikingly similar to Ed Bronkowski, <laughs> I realized after reading uh, The Blondes of Wisconsin. Um, Tony and I, to my knowledge, did not, um, we collaborated in no conscious way, really. But um, so Tony asked me to read a few poems from, um, well, one poem from Rose's perspective and then several from uh, Williams, because I think they're really almost, if, if Ed Bronkowski wrote poetry, these would be poems that he would have written. So I'll start with the first. This is in Rose's voice. It's called Sunrise. I live with my, I live with my real dad in a trailer park on a ridge above town and mom's already on her third husband over in Wisconsin now. I had a big brother for a while for mom's first marriage out west, but he went to Iraq and only half of them came back. Sometimes I feel like the other half, haunting his old life, but that's usually nights when dad's on the road and I'm alone, and to make the feeling go away, I curl up with Tiger on the couch, and we watch war movies in the dark, and I smoke dad's cigarettes, Mom was drunk at the funeral, moaning and crying things like, my baby is dead, and I love him more than anyone else. And why did God do this to me? She left early to get more drunk, and everyone was relieved to see her go. I don't hate her. I know that out west was some kind of Eden for her, and she burned it down in grand style. And she thought she could get away from it, but it's burning inside her still, and she drinks to put it out but that only feeds the fire. I suppose you could say she's in hell and I'm just across the river. Sometimes I sit outside on the steps and imagine Travis sitting beside me. You shouldn't be smoking, he says. You shouldn't be dead, I say. Everyone dies, he says. It's natural as a sunrise. What does it feel like? You know, like coming home from far away. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, Rose is a young, kind of melancholy spirit, um, kind of struggling with a little depression, um, maybe struggling with her feelings about her friend Kat um, a little bit, and the death of her, of her stepbrother, who she really cared about quite a bit. Um, so... Tony asked me to read a couple more. So this is this is William Blood. He's a retired. Uh, he was in Vietnam. He's a veteran. He when he got back, he uh, joined the well worked on a ship. So he's a retired sailor as well, and he boxed when he was younger. Um, and he he's led a very um, unfortunately rather common um, you know. Midwestern industrial working class lifestyle with all of the expectations of his role as a man um, 
in, in, that, in that class. Right. So this is called Touch. I've known the intimacy of the world mostly by blows, rib by broken rib, nose by broken nose. Over time, it crushed one ear, slashed the other, smashed a kneecap, snapped an arm, shattered both orbital cavities. It slapped me, burned me, ripped me, stabbed me, buried shrapnel like treasure inside me. I have not wanted it this way. I have yearned to rest this flesh against something other than blows. I have yearned even for a love without touch, and the yearning burned in my gut like a memory of illicit acts, until lifting a glass or tightening a screw or gripping a doorknob, I was aware I held what countless others had, and in that I felt their hands. All right, and I believe you also wanted me to read Who Knows? It's another boxing poem. Although that last one wasn't just boxing, that was just about life in general for, for William. Okay. And this one has a little sly little nod to um, Ezra Pound in it. I like to work, in this collection in particular, I like to work literary influences in because both of these characters are, for the first time in their lives, really starting to read poetry, and it kind of influences their uh, the verse that they write. So, who knows? In my prize fighting years, I broke over 50 noses. Where, I wonder, are they now? Nuzzling the air inside pint glasses, regally saluting the earth over their heads, under stones no one's read more than once. Do they still float like mine toward suggestions of heaven that turn out to be backyard barbecues? Do they still remember my right hand this thing already anticipating its next life as some kind of animal claw. It loved them once, this ugly thing. It loved to make them new. And one more. Which one was it? Um, hang on. Oh, there we are. Passage. Okay, so this one starts in, in a singular first person, and it, it moves to uh, plural first person. And I, when I was reading it through uh, just before the reading, because Tony asked me to read it, um, it occurred to me that it might begin as like an Ed Bronkowski poem, but it ends as an Ed and uh, Verna Larson poem with the we. So it's called Passage. I was beaten already by the time I boarded my first ship at the westernmost tip of Lake Superior, deep in the heart of the continent. The war had spit me out, and I woke still drunk on my mother's back porch, and I walked two blocks to the lake, signed the papers, and climbed aboard an ore freighter. As I painted the deck, I watched the continent slide by, cliffs and trees and then cities, a steady breeze at our back. When we passed through the locks, children at the railings cried out and waved hello, goodbyes. And then, one day, the ocean opened up before us, and there was no earth but us, nothing but the blue of the water, and the blue of heaven, and the blue of us hovering between. And so we passed from the world to beyond it, in one fluid motion, from the terrible grip of life into something as much like death as anyone could know in this world, and yet bend to work, and yet rise to see the blue eternity, and breathe and know somewhere back there still is home, and between is nothing but more of where we are. All right. Those are the poems Tony wanted. Where in the heck, Jason, did you first, I read this, I've read your book three times. First time I read it, I about fell over when I read this first line. In my prize writing years, I broke over 50 noses. Where did you get that? That's a great line. Yeah, it just sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's equal to, um, to Fat City, Leonard Gardner's Fat City, which begins, it's about a, uh, it's about a 10th rate fighter, Fat City. is about uh, this, I, Billy Tully, I think his name is. And the first line of that wonderful novel 
is uh, he lived in the Hotel Coma. <laughs> and then you write, nice. this is the second best boxing line. In my prize fighting years, I broke over 50 noses. I thought, this guy has got some knowledge that I didn't know you had. <laughs> Well, I, I not much. I, I did a little boxing in high school, but I did not stick with it. So that's yeah. You've had you've had more experience in boxing, didn't you? I've, I've, seen, I've sparred in different gyms. I once answered a advertisement in the Daily Iowa newspaper. Sparring partner wanted, <laughs> and the guy had some <laughs> amateur fights, you know. And I worked out with other guys, mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen a, a lot of fights, uh, you know, and. All, all over the place, a lot of pri uh, amateur and professional fights, but that really impressed me. And I think there is that uh, it's verisimilitude that makes me believe your characters the way you, well, the Tijuana poem, mm. I've been to -town, this poem, so many others. And I, I believe Rose Murtha. Now, I have nothing in common with her. She's a teen who lives in West Duluth in a trailer court. But I come to I come to listen to her and to believe in her, and of course William Blood is closer to my own blood, and so uh, I understand him. But I am really impressed by the way you have found your way into these characters. Now, Jason, I discovered this when I was preparing. You know, uh, Ed Bronkowski and Verna, and there are other characters in the Book of Stories, The Blondes of Wisconsin. But those two principal or those two characters, they find what they seek after years of unhappiness, they find each other. But I, I wonder about your characters. And I wrote this, uh, Jason, your characters, teenaged Rose, Mirtha, and middle-aged William Blood, especially Blood, find what they've been seeking by never finding it. They never, William Blood doesn't find love. He had love with Mary and then she, she threw him out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, he has a kind of affection for Merzad, and so too, I think, maybe for Rose. They they have they feel affection for others, but I don't think they succeed in these in any relationships in their lives. And so, uh, whereas my characters do, but it's ultimately doomed the relationship of Ed and Verna because Ed's going downhill to Boxer's dementia. Um, in yours, I was thinking that they've been seeking thing they've been seeking something in life, but and by seeking it, they never find it, but they do come to a philosophical understanding of what they've lost. Does that make any sense? Yeah, they, I think they, they, they feel resigned to their fates in a sense. I mean, it, it's a very um, kind of anti-romantic, but uh, you, you could call it a, I don't know. It. I was trying to capture the feeling of... Um, Part of it was in, I feel in the Midwest in particular, but not just the Midwest, it could be America, you know, we live under this kind of, you know, pure, we still live under this puritanical kind of regime <laughs> where people don't share their feelings, they don't share their, their thoughts, they, you know, we, we maintain this um, sort of stoic um, independence, particularly the males. And um, that makes it really hard to, you, you, someone who could be, you know, a, a really a kindred spirit could be standing right next to you and you're just not talking. You're not even making eye contact, you know. Um, there's no way you would ever know. And so there's so much potential that is lost because people don't speak to one another. And, um, you know, I think, I mean, I wrote this way before, well, you know, I finished it a couple of years ago, but the, the events of this past year or two have really kind of driven home even more to me the really the, the tragedies that can befall us when we don't talk to one another and we don't reach out. And unfortunately, these two characters are tragic characters. You know, it's the epilogue is, um, you know, acknowledges that they're never going to meet, but that it, it implores the reader to please try to make it possible for characters like this to meet in the future. You know, especially if you might feel identify with one of them, you know, to, um, so for you, um, Verna and Ed, you know, they do connect and they do have something really, something real. And I think one of the most beautiful pieces in, in your, one of the most beautiful stories is the Shipmaster's Ball, which if we have time later, I'll ask you to read the last little bit of it. But, um, 
you know, you what you've done to your characters is almost worse than what I've <laughs> done to mine, you know, and I felt a bit um, sadistic, as I'm sure a lot of writers do. Um, but yours was even worse because you gave them heaven and then you took it away through dementia. I mean, could you talk a little bit about that decision as an author? Yeah, uh, thanks for t telling me. <laughs> I I make you feel worse than your own your own fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought of that, but you you sure are right, Jason. Because the guy succumbs more and more, and finally he ends up back home in Superior, a punch drunk fighter who signs on to to uh, uh, be featured in a bout against the blondes of Wisconsin who that's a troop of, of uh, women boxers who go around northern well will go around the state of Wisconsin fighting in these crummy taverns they bring their own portable ring and they're in great condition so they they always win their fights because they fight these losers and bums who are half slosh sometimes and that's becomes Eddie Bronkowski in the end he gets in the ring with uh, with the, the best boxer on the blondes of Wisconsin the women's boxing team and he he looks he looks just terrible. She can't tell what kind of shoes he's got on. He's wearing brown, baggy brown pants. I mean, the guy is just terrible. But that's the end of Ann Brodkowski. So you're right. I think it's crueler what I have done. And I didn't intend it that way because I wanted him to be a noble spirit. Um, oh, shucks. No, Jason. Oh, yeah. Here's something. Uh, you you I did see various allus allusions to uh, other writers in your work. I thought Blake, of course, in the Tiger poem. Um, Robert Frost, there's a line that that alludes, I think, to Robert Frost. But did you think, did you know, and I perhaps push, am pushing this too much, but your poem, uh, Who Knows, is that the one about the nose? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, who, who, I just noticed the, the pun, who knows. Uh, the, the, Gogol, uh, Nikolai Gogol wrote a, a short novel or novella, I guess, called The Nose. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, I, I read it long ago. Yeah, yep. that, that's not influencing you in that poem. Um, no, not consciously, although that's a great, I mean, you know, he inspired, uh, revolutionized Russian literature, um, and I, you know, did read his work, but um, yeah, probably The Overcoat had more influence yeah. over me than The Nose, but um no, I, I was. Uh, I, I wanted to circle back a little bit to your comment about noble spirits. Um, you so that that might kind of redeem us, I guess, as authors, <laughs> because I too was creating these two characters who I felt were really noble. You know, um, I, I, you know, almost saintly, I guess. They take a lot of punishment. Um, they endure a lot of suffering, um, and they they really only mean well. But um, this is just their lot in life, sort of. Um, and they, they use poetry to process it and to, um, to manage it, you know. I guess for Ed, though, you know, he, um, yeah, he's a, he's a hero, you know. I mean, so what you're doing to him through the, the authorial punishment is raising his, <laughs> turning him into a, beatific character right he's a beat he's yeah. he's been beat down and that makes him saintly in a sense yeah. and that's more the language i think you would use probably jason i thought your poem touched i mean i thought so many of these poems were absolutely wonderful touch i mean the guy is so desperate william blood he is so desperate to connect with someone that he will even find consolation and comfort in uh T using a screwdriver or in touching a doorknob because some other human has touched that doorknob. I'm reading this right, aren't I? Yeah, yep, yeah, that's it. I think it. that is just beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, he feels really isolated um, and uh, almost incapable of, of breaking out of that that isolation. Um, but you, you did mention his roommate, Merzad. Yeah. And I, ironic, incidentally, there were a couple more poems spoken in Merzad's voice um, in this collection, but um, he they were written in his voice because they're persona poems, and he is, his English was very broken because he's learning English. And, and what is his um, nationality? 
Uh, he's from Afghan. He's an Afghan refugee. Yeah. He was sponsored by a local church. Um, I've, I've, you know, encountered a number of refugees in my life, um, friends of mine, you know, from the Serbian conflict, for example, who were, who were sponsored. Um, so he was just kind of based on, uh, you know, some friends of mine, basically, but using a more recent conflict. And um, he, anyway, those poems were taken out. Sensitivity readers didn't, they thought he sounded uneducated, and, you know, and I, I deferred because I didn't want the book to be questioned, <laughs> you know, based on a few poems I love. But anyway, he is touched. He's mentioned briefly, as you pointed out in the book. And William Blood is really, he is William's chance at um, redemption, I guess, his chance to reach out again to, to other human beings. So he mentions it in one, one or two poems, but his goal is really to, to, to kind of protect and to help Murzad to recover from the loss of his family, because Murzad's family was literally killed in a, in a drone strike. Um, so William Blood is, he's kind of planning, you know, to, to help Murzad to recover as long as that takes. And that's pretty much the end of his life goal because he feels that he's probably only got you know maybe 10 15 years left um so anyway that's that is his attempt to reach out of his isolation and his poetry which is really just in a journal for who knows who to read jason you know uh these characters uh rose Murtha, I, again i love the name it seems like a perfect name for northern minnesota Murtha. Rose Murtha, William Blood, and Mirzad, they do meet uh, at least, well, at least once because Horns in the Harbor, uh, she, Rose, the teenager, may be hearing boat whistles or foghorns in the Duluth Harbor up there on the hill, in hillside in Duluth. And so too might William Blood be hearing the horns in the harbor where he is. And, and, and you say that Mirzad lives well, blood too in South Superior, I think you say the South End. Well, he conceivably he could hear a boat whistle that far away. Probably not, but they're connected in this way. Yeah, yeah. Actually, they. I imagine them living in my attic. I was living in this old, like, nineteenth century house that I was renting part of it, and there was, was a certain was that one, was that was that one by, in East End or Central Park? Yes, yeah, Central Park. Yeah, no, by no, Central no. Park. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is really close. I used to run up and down East End all the time when I was running uh, out to the Nemaji Cemetery. It's all in the book. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a servants' quarters up up above that was just they blew insulation, you know, so was no one could live up there. I don't know how anyone lived up there, you know. I mean, it used to be a lot colder. I've back been then. there. Had, I've been there. I've been in there. Yeah, yeah the and they only had coal. They had coal fireplaces to heat the whole yeah. place. It was crazy. Anyway, so I imagine them living, renting the, the floor, like the third floor up above me. But, um, yeah, they that poem, uh, Horns in the Harbor, is, you know, it's an attempt for me to point out that no matter how distant we feel from one another, we still experience certain key moments in life that we all share. And for people living in the Twin Ports, it's those it's the sounds of the boat. It's, I mean, one of many things, like the storm we experienced the other night when mm -hmm. you and I were practicing for this. I'm in yeah. Duluth, you're in Superior, and your power went out because <laughs> a storm that was passing over, um, which made my lights flicker. Um, but, um, yeah, did you I, – I, you mentioned maybe wanting me to read that poem. Did you want yeah. me to – will you? Will you? It's it's short. So what, what page? I've got it, the page written down, but I forgot. In case listeners or viewers want to turn to that page, uh, it's on uh, what? Yeah, it's a, a rose poem. Twenty-two, page twenty-two. We should be keep our eye on the time too, here, Tony. Yes. I haven't got through really many of my questions for you, so. Okay. I'll make this. It's a, it's a quick one. And actually, uh, William Blood is mentioned in this poem. Um, mm -hmm. She doesn't know him, but, you know, I'm, I'm both of them, so he's mentioned. Horns in the Harbor. What baby waking to the terrors of its crib? What gutshot beast bleeding beside the creek? What old man lying sleepless in a rented attic room, reassessing his life too late? Who hears this very night what I hear moaning over the water, 
each tuned to the same source, like echoes lighting up the hillside, when blood reaches the end of us and turns again toward the heart. Nicely done, Jason. Jason, may I say one thing, and then you may proceed with the questions, or I shall yeah. question you. I'll question you. You know what I think is wonderful, too, is the poems are almost evenly sp split between Rose and William. I think Ro Rose has 34 or 35 poems dedicated to her, Blood 34, maybe. And then you have that uh, uh, the ending, the last poem. Uh, which is a kind of a merging of the two sensibilities, as you say. I think it's wonderfully structured, and I love the way Arkansas, in the front matter, or in the table of contents, lists the rose poems in the left-hand column and the blood poems in the right-hand column. It's a beautiful Yeah, yeah it was really nice formatting. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it started as just um, William Blood poems. Honestly, I was just, I had that one persona, and I just kept going and it started feeling too relentless and his life was just too dark and <laughs> depressing. And, and, you know, it's because he's, he's nearing the end and he's reassessing his life too late and it's, he's made a lot of mistakes um, and he's been treated really poorly. So I needed somebody who, I needed something to, to lighten the mood and, and with Rose, even though we, her future is uncertain, I like I like to think she's going to have some breaks, you know, that she'll become like a young, you know, like a successful woman poet or something, you know, um, later in her life. But at this point in her life, she's she doesn't know, but she's young, so it could be, you know. And you even, Jason, you even reflect her a uh, poetic, growing poetic sensibility. Uh, crude though it is, but she was, she she's in high school when she writes the poem about, uh, I think it's about the teacher and you rhyme, you have this awkward, simple rhyme scheme that a, that a, a 13 year old boy or girl would write, but it's funny and it, it is indicative of, of something about her sensibility. Yeah, it was, it was a challenge. I mean, I, I was trying to write like someone starting out but to make it sound acceptable to yeah. sophisticated readers of poetry so it's kind of it's campy it's kind of tongue-in-cheek at times it's, it was a wonderful poem and i think you rhymed trigonometry with something i can't remember yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good poem and uh, the different voices in this in this book are, are appealing yeah ask me, ask me something well, or yeah yeah um i i think you know one of the you said this theme I mean, it's in all of your books. I've, I've read a number of them. And the Polish-American experience is really central. Um, and if it's not central, it's at least peripheral. And um, and part of that is this um, feeling of loss, a, a loss of a culture, a loss of language, just this tremendous collective loss of identity that Polish-Americans feel, um, at least in this part of the, you know, the Midwest. And I, it just, it occurred to me as I was reading your, this latest book of yours that Ed Bronkowski is, he's experiencing memory loss as well. And I, and I was wondering if that was intentional on your part to have him represent the loss of, of Polish American culture uh, in America. I think uh, I, I perhaps subconsciously, but I am aware of what has happened in the, in the first story in this book, uh, the the protagonist the, and narrator bemoans the fact that five of our ethnic parishes in Superior have closed. Five or four, I can't remember. St. Adelbert's is, was my Polish church. That was closed by order of the bishop. St. Stanislaus was another Polish church in Superior that was closed by order of the bishop. This was years ago. St. Cyril and Methodius was the Slovak parish. Uh, that was closed. Oh, uh, 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 Oh, shoot, there was another that escaped. Oh, yeah, St. Louis was mainly French and Indian people down by the, the waterfront, down by the boat, uh, uh, where they repair the vessels down in the north end. That was closed by order of the bishop. There is this great loss, you know. Uh, Poles escaped to the suburbs and big cities. The culture, uh, the culture begins to wane interest in it, except for perhaps at Christmas uh, and uh, maybe Easter, but beyond that, it's it's something that is troubling to uh, to um, to some of us, I guess. And so maybe Ed Bronkowski is emblematic of that. I hadn't thought of it, but it, it very well could be true. 
And it certainly influences the tone of a lot of your work, this mm -hmm. feeling of, of responsibility. I mean, do you feel a responsibility as, as a sort of cultural, um, you know, preserver or a, a documenter, a witness, I suppose, for your people? Sure do. Um, I, I do. Uh, I, I have not written about anything for the last 35 years, maybe, but Polish Americans in Northern Wisconsin. I'm not speaking about Pol Polish Americans in other parts of the country. I'm speaking about the Polish Americans in Northwestern Wisconsin and about my my neighborhood and my family. Uh, I've, I've dedicated myself to this, to bring attention to us in this multicultural world. I want to have Polish Americans uh, have some attention. So too do I want my beloved Superior Wisconsin to have some attention. I've said for so many years that we are as noble and ignoble, we're as venal, as prideful, as heroic, as uh, loving and generous and mean-spirited as uh, any Muscovite, any Parisian, any Londoner, we are as good as they. And so why not, should, why should we not receive some attention here in Northwestern Wisconsin? And Polish culture, well, yes, I am trying to, and thankfully there are others among us, the St. Paul poet, John Mincheski, uh, Stuart Dybeck, Suzanne Strembeck, Shea, uh, Shea, John Guzlowski. There are other uh, Polish American uh, fiction writers and poets who are helping in this effort. I should point out for our audience that even though that community is, you know, sort of the, the environment that your characters live in, um, it's the stories reverberate for anyone from any cultural background. It's just that it provides you with the vehicle for the sense of a struggle and loss that I think all of us can can understand and appreciate from our own different, you know, cultural perspectives. Jason, I'm uh, a, I'm a member, proud member, a long-term member of the Polish Club, the Tadeusz Kosciuszko Lodge of Superior, former president. My father and uncles were active in the club. It formed in 1928, so I am a member of this too. Our, we'll have our next meeting next Thursday, by the way. Great. So um, I'm looking at the time yeah, here. Yeah. How much time is left? It's uh, 7.48 is what my, my laptop's telling me. So I'm wondering if maybe, Annie, did you want us to uh, open this up for questions or did you want to come in and? Well, we have, uh, we have a lot of great comments. So thank you everyone who has chimed in. I see so far one actual question from Lori Herzl. Hi, Lori, if you're still watching. Um, uh, she would like Tony to talk a little bit about your own days as a boxer, if, if you can do that. Now, Lori misunderstood me when I wrote her. Uh, because Crystal Lawler interviewed me for the Duluth News Tribune, and she asked, well, did you, uh, did you box? I said, no, I was too old for Golden Gloves, and I was unsure about entering um, AAU, Amateur Athletic Union Competition, because in AAU you have novice and open. I maybe could have fought as a novice, but you don't know who you're going to draw as your opponent. And uh, I was a little old for that, but I did spar in a lot of gyms. Uh, yeah, but not not uh, formally. Got it. But you certainly have, you know, a knowledge of the sport clearly from, a from little. Your amateur uh, sparring and, and from your writing. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if you are still watching, uh, please ask a question or two. We've got some great comments. Um, Mary says, even in Connecticut, a Polish friend bemoans the dwindling presence of the Polish National Club. Less people are participating and their traditions and celebrations may fade away. So it sounds like that is, uh, there's a community over in Connecticut it's having something very mm -hmm. similar. Uh, and Mary also says, Jason, great to hear your poems. You have a natural flow, giving perspective to your characters. Well, thanks for that. And Stephen was very pleased to hear your, your poems as well, Jason. Um, do you like fried shrimps? <laughs> I, I see Lori's, Lori Herzl's got a question. Oh, yeah, about, yeah, your knowledge of life on boats. I was, that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you. What kind of research did you do? Because you have so much, so many like authentic details about different professions. I know some of those, like the mill workers from your father who worked in a mill. 
But what? How did you? How did you gain and, that level of knowledge about maritime work? Jason and, and Annie and, and Lori and Doug and others. It's not hard if you grew up here. My father was a seaman on the Great Lakes and on the ocean. Most of my friends were Great Lakes sailors. One, Dennis Abrahamson, sailed on the big water, the ocean, never sailed on the lakes. But my friend Bobby Kazuski, Ronnie Henderson, all my friends were on the lakes. Uh, my friend Ed Copens was the youngest first mate on the lakes at one time and later went on to Captain Stuart J. Court. So it's just, and I grew up uh, probably two blocks from the waterfront. So I could hear the, you know, boats in the harbor, talk, listen to my father talk about um, the days at sea and on the lakes. It's just part of the culture up here. I was going to go on the boats when I got out of the Marine Corps in June of 67. But then I thought I'd been away enough and I, I thought I would just relax that summer. So I didn't have to do too much research. But when I did need to, I talked to my cousin, Bob Novak, mm. uh, who grew up in Superior. He sailed on the lakes. Or I caught, talked to my cousin Joey Novak or Dennis Aho, who is, I think, maybe retired now, but he was he was piloting here in the harbor and the pilot boat that goes out to bring in the, the, the ocean going freighters into Duluth Superior Harbor. He, and he himself had been a sailor. So I, there are people I can ask. I didn't have to ask too many times, though. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is that a question? Uh, take that one, Annie. Sure. <laughs> uh, Anthony, do you ever get mixed up with Charles Bukowski? Yeah, I do. And I'm glad you asked that because I've always wanted to write a story or at least an essay called Bukowski on Bukowski on Bukowski. Yeah. Because, because there's there's Charles Bukowski, then there's the Soviet dissident Vladimir Bukowski, and then there's uh, Char well, Charles Bukowski and Anthony Bukowski. So Bukowski on Bukowski on Bukowski. I do, people sometimes. And that, that, that sometimes redounds in my favor because if they buy a book thinking they're buying a book by Charles Bukowski and they get my book, well, you know. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've only, read, I've only read one of Charles Bukowski's books. Uh, that was Post Office. Mm hmm I've read so a few. Yeah, may, I tell you how, uh, may I tell you how the Star Tribune titled, uh, I don't know if it's called a headline in, in journalist, journalese, but the, when the Star Tribune reviewed uh, the Blondes of Wisconsin, the headline reads, Boxers, Deckhands, Hard Scrabble Poles. I love that. <laughs> Hard Scrabble Poles. Yeah. Nice. Boxers, Deckhands. Yeah. yeah. Well, Speaking of that, that could maybe be a title of a literary tour of the Twin Ports or something. Mm. Uh, Deborah says, great reading. Could the two of you be convinced to give a literary tour of, of, the, of the Twin Ports? Sure. Fun. Yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Definitely. I can answer the, the shrimp question, by the oh, way, yeah. Stephen. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I love fried shrimp. Particularly barbecued shrimp with, with garlic and butter. <laughs> uh. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so I think we got through all questions. So if you, we still have a few more minutes. If you're watching and have another question, please write it now. But um, Jason, I'll throw it to you to maybe ask Tony one more if you've got one. Yeah, yeah. So Tony, like one of the elephants in the room here is that we both have a character who's very similar. Um, and I recall, it, you know, your Ed and my, my William. So I was wondering, like, how do we both stumble across this character with a very similar backstory, similar sentiments, disposition? Any, any ideas? No, Jason, but I think it was the most wonderful convergence of sensibilities. I couldn't believe it. Now, you, Jason and I would occasionally have an adult beverage at the Anchor Bar. <laughs> uh, I think Laurie knows the Anchor and Doug the anchor bar in Superior. And you, I think I was probably talking to you about writing this book, The Blondes of Wisconsin and its characters, but not much. And I think you, I know you did before the book was taken, mentioned to me about William Blood, but how, how could this thing have happened? How could the two of us be writing about not dissimilar characters in Superior Duluth and Duluth Superior? I think it's just a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful miracle to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could be the, the spirit of the place taking human form, maybe. Um, well, that's what I wanted to ask you. How, why, when did you realize the poetic 
uh, possibilities of the twin ports? Oh, um, well, I mean, wherever I am, that's that's just the challenge of an artist, right? You you take the material you're given, and that's what you have to work with. So, yeah, but um, what if you're alien to the place and you found no nothing, uh, and not you weren't in tune to it? So that's that's not yeah. Ideal. No, I mean, I do um, appreciate. I, I know you've said you've you know, Superior is an ugly town, and you love it. And I, I wouldn't word it quite that way, but it's it's definitely very, um, you know, post-industrial, kind of got a wasteland feel to it. And, you know, wastelands are really close to my heart. <laughs> so I find them just just haunting and poetic, you know. When I was a kid, I used to go to the playground in summer when it was there was nobody there and the weeds were like, you know, three feet tall growing up between the cracks and the asphalt and you know, those swings are just swaying eerily in the breeze. And I loved it there. I never loved the playground as much as I did when there was no one there and it looked like a ghost town. So, wow. you know, that's just me, I guess. Jason and Nanny, if you could have seen Superior in the 50s, or I was born in 45, but in the 50s when I was growing up and in the early 60s, it was, I, I, I look, I love this town. Uh, I love Superior without without a reservation i could not live anywhere else but it's superior but it has had its ugly side i'm telling you when the dust is blowing off the lime dock you go out to the aloise neighborhood of, of, of superior go out there and you want a tour i'll give you a tour and jason will join us there's red ore dust on the houses that comes off the taconite dock uh dust would bl blow up from the lime plant uh, it, it, we had all these taverns. I mean, the we had far more taverns than any town could possibly support, or maybe not. But now they ripped many of them down, and what remains in the places of those taverns, like the Heartbreak Bar and uh, the Lafayette and places like that, are empty lots through which the wind blows. I think uh, Crystal Lawler tells me that she finds it appealing and that it is enjoying a, rena a renaissance, a renaissance. Uh, but I guess I'm stuck in the 50s and 60s, and uh, and and so I I I describe it in the way I do. But one mustn't misunderstand. I do love Superior very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating place. People people do not. I mean, there's reticence. There's this kind of Midwestern reticence. But I've noticed in Superior, um, especially in the bars, which I used to frequent more often, but um, people don't hold their opinions in that much, you know, <laughs> they'll, they'll share their thoughts with you. And what, regardless of whether those thoughts are confrontational or really sad. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, fascinating place. A friend gave me a tour, by the way. He, he was renting a room in the, the Heartbreak Hotel, which is in a former store of yours. It's a famous brothel in, in Superior. And he was recently staying there. Yeah, it's it's like a oh, you know, uh, that's that was a heartbreak bar. It was a bar. A guy got killed there. A boxer, in fact, a boxer the, killed. Yeah, no, there was a hotel. I guess that was. It was, it was the house of prostitutions at three fourteen, yeah. three sixteen, and five eight. Like in the it's north still end. there. Sure, it's still there. Yeah, he showed me a room where this guy had a heart attack and died, and his his spirit still haunts the hotel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating stuff. Could definitely give some tours. All right, we'll start planning it. So far, uh, stops include possibly the Anchor Bar, <laughs> and then uh, Haunted Old Brothel. Brothel. <laughs> well, the Ordos the on Aloise. Can, yeah. you say, can I say one thing? I use this, uh, what do you call it? It's not on, not alliteration. I don't know what you call it, but in one of my stories, I came up with a good idea for how to pronounce Aloise. That is a section, a Belgian section, the Belgian section of uh, in Superior is by the Ordox, and the houses have wear ore dust on them. And I, I have some of the characters, they don't say Aloise, they say Aloise, you know, like they're wheezing. <laughs> Aloise, and I spell it W H E Z E. It, it took me a while coming from northeastern Wisconsin, where ours is pronounced Alloway. It took yeah. me a while to get used to saying Alloways. It's still a little difficult for me, but yeah, we'll say it the way we say it, Jason. <laughs> I, 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 do. I do. I yeah. do. 
Oh, well, obviously, uh, the Twin Ports is very fertile ground for literature, both fiction and poetry. Um, okay, we'll do this one last question uh, from Stephen. How do you want your characters to be remembered? Ooh. Um, I like Tony's phrase earlier as, as noble spirits. That's how I'd like mine to be remembered. Yeah, they worked hard and they lived hard. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for thank your you. wonderful comments and questions. Thanks for watching. As a reminder, the links to both Blondes of Wisconsin and Rose and Blood are farther back in the chat. So you can head to the Majors and Quinn website through those links, or you can just go yourself to www.majorsandquinn.com. Do a little browsing if you're so inclined. Thanks so much again to both Tony and Jason for being here tonight and putting on this wonderful conversation and hope to have you back sometime. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank and thanks you. everyone for, uh, for watching. Have a good evening. <laughs>